Yeah. I like front or side over here, but I hate my profile. <laughs> my wife loves my profile. She's yeah, crazy. she does. She's crazy. Yeah. It's great That's to be in Denmark. It's great to be in Europe. It's great to be alive. It's great to be breathing. It's great to be playing rock and roll. We are now called officially, for the record, the Dictators NYC. Just for the record. For many years, we had played Spain. And we made money, and we had fun, and we did well. And then Andy, the major songwriter in the band, decided no more. Arbitrarily, no more. And every year we'd say, come on. He'd say, no. Come on, no. Then it got even worse. I own a bar, Manitoba's, in New York City. It's at 99 Avenue B, like Bruce, between 6th and 7th Streets in Manhattan. I would say people, and I'm not, it's a little tiny mom and pop hole in the wall bar with a hundred rock and roll pictures on the wall. People from all over the world, all over the world, when I say all over the world, I mean 12 countries in Europe, people from Japan, people from Australia, people from South America, and from maybe 30 states in America would visit, not every day. But they would visit, and every once in a while, it's like, when are you guys going to play again? Why aren't you playing? And we would just hang our heads and go, Andy, Andy doesn't want to. We gave Andy all the power. And sometimes, I call it growing. You, you, sometimes it takes an evolution of growth. And our evolution was, wait a minute, wait a minute. Andy wrote the songs, but since day one, Ross the Boss, Handsome Dick Manitoba, Scott Kettner, Top Ten. We were there. We were in the rehearsal studios. And when Andy was the lead singer, nobody cared about him being the lead singer because he had no, he was a, a, a good songwriter, but he had no charisma on stage. So people would just go like this. <laughs> yeah. And then the one day they gave me the microphone, everyone went crazy. The first time, Wild Thing by the Trogs. And uh, ever since then, I built and built and built, and the more I did it, the more I used the microphone, the more I entertained the people. So the, it was a perfect combination of sort of like the coach, the manager of the team, telling you the plans of how we're gonna play the game, and then giving the ball to the guy who was gonna play the game. And we said, please, Andy, and he said, no, 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 no. People kept coming, people kept coming. We're getting older, we're getting older. And the point got to, you know what, this is not fair. We have put 40 years of our life, even though we didn't write the songs, we were part of the fiber of the songs. We, we went to every rehearsal, we went to every gig, we were part of it. And we deserved to do the songs because we wanted to. And he didn't want to. So we went out, we got Daniel Ray, who worked with Ronnie Spector and the Ramones, Produced them, wrote songs with the remotes. We got this amazing bass player, Dean Rispler. We got the original guitar player, one of the great rock guitar players in the world, Ross the Boss. We got me, greatest front man in the world. We got uh, JP Thunderbolt Patterson, who's been our longest drummer ever. So it's close enough to being the Dictators without it being like uh, like some of these bands play the Drifters or play in Las Vegas with like no original members or one original. This is most of the dictators, and everybody except Andy wants us to do it. Andy doesn't want us to do it. However, the good thing is I started writing my own songs. So the more songs I write myself, the more independence we'll have. We will be celebrating the history of the music that we helped create, and we will be celebrating new songs that we are creating, that I am creating. You want to go in, inside? Yeah, let's do that. Well, I can tell you this, the last place Joe Ramon ever played live was in Manitoba's bar. I don't have a stage, but in the back, he was with his friends, his band that he, that he managed. But he played, I have a big picture on the wall of him with them. And then soon thereafter, he went into the hospital. I um, called him and made a joke and he was not in a good way. He, he kind of didn't get the joke. I said, Joey, come on. When my friends are sick, 
what I try to do is treat them as though they're not sick. Like, I don't go, yeah. you okay? I go like this, Yo, what's up, man? Get the yeah. fuck out of this hospital. When are you going to get better? Come on, let's go party. Yeah. And they're like, stop, you're making me laugh, stop. And that's it. Joey didn't take it that way. No. I said, Joey, come on, let's go, let's go. I got things to do. We got, well, let's have some fun. And he was like, what, 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 what are you kidding me? He, he took it wrong. And that's okay. When you're sick, you're allowed to take it any way you want. I know how I meant it. And I know where my heart was. And that will not define a 30-year relationship. Uh, there were certain people like Daniel Ray, very close to Joey, wrote songs with Joey. Arturo Vega, obviously. Monty Melnick, the road manager. I found personally that all of a sudden, because Joey was so loved and famous, people were all running to his deathbed to be friends with him. And close, I was close, I was with Joey, I was close to Joey, I was with him when he was dying. It was like, you understand the expression, jockeying for position. They were jockeying for position to be close to Joey, to say they were near Joey when he died. And they were pals with Joey. There were acquaintances and pals. But not that group of people that's with you when you die. No. They weren't that. They were fucking full of shit. Well, we're, we are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have clothing that's in the museum. So if you go to the punk rock ring, you have a Patti Smith jacket, Joey Ramon, you know, like uh, uh, Richard Hell and Ramon. That's a good, that's a good company. Um, I, I'm not one of those people, um, if I talk to John Lydon, who's a good man, I've talked to many times. There's, there's room for plenty of opinions. I respect his opinion of walking away and saying it's full of shit because a part of me says the whole thing is full of shit and stupid. But, but I don't often see life in black and white. I see it in grays a lot. Once in a while, black and white. In this one, I see it in gray. It's full of shit. It, it's overpriced. I can't afford to go myself. You know, I'm talking for big time rock stars to afford. That's the bad part. The good part is, if somebody pats me on the back and says, "Richard, for your 43 years of working your ass off and playing rock and roll, we would like to give you an accolade. We would like to give you something, uh, a pat on the back, and a." And a an award for spending a lifetime of making great music, I'd say thank you. Thank you very much. But let me tell you something. Yeah. It's an honor at my age being able to be given a gift from whatever you believe in. It could be God, it could be the heavens, it could be a goddess. Whatever you believe in has given me energy at my age that I'm almost not supposed to have. The fact that I can travel to like 12 countries, 10 countries, 21 cities in three weeks at my age and play rock and roll and have fun and get paid and give people entertainment, it's my honor. And I'm not fucking a humble man, but I get humble when I know I can still do this. It's my honor to be here.